heading out to get at a tire shop together in Hightown, just in, in Titusville, about 45 minutes south of Erie. And we all kind of hung out together and decided that yeah, we're going to form this thing. Now, my buddy owns the tire shop, but he also lives next door, and there isn't a Mrs. Tommy Cooper, so we took advantage of that, and we put a couple studios in his house. Um, and we film different podcasts and interview shows right out of our TRT studios that's in his house. And we call it TRT because his tire shop is Thompson Run Tire. And so we turned, uh, turned his residence into our headquarters and our studio. We have two different studios for two different settings. Um, one we use for our actual our podcast, which we do on both Skype and Zoom. And we talk to a lot of the, the big footers, some of them that are here today. We've interviewed them and we put that on there and that's called our, our uh, Three Beers at Race. Uh, we also do a Cryptovania interview show where we bring Bigfoot researchers from all over the country. We put them up in a in local hotel and we take them out for a weekend of Bigfooting and then we interview them about our experience together and their experiences making stuff. Uh, my favorite of those is Tony Merkel of the Confessionals. Him and his brother came up and they spent the weekend and we did a we did a couple of night trips to, to Miller Farm Cemetery in the middle of the night. Uh, that was fantastic. We do another show called Five Pounds of Sugar where we bring in people that are making their living in a way that's not punching a time clock. They're doing something fun that they love. And the first person that was a guest on Five Pounds of Sugar was a guy named R.A. Mahalo. And if you're at all familiar with the uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he played uh, Leatherface in number two and number three of those, of those movies. And he just grew up a couple of miles away from our HQ. And so we got him to come in and, and talk about how he became an actor and uh, a, a young, a big kid, he's a big kid. Um, and he was a farmer from Townville, Pennsylvania. And eventually his only way of making a living was making horror films and going to horror cons and comic cons and stuff. Um, he's got about 40 to 45 uh, uh, movies under his belt, including uh, two of the uh, uh, Leatherface, uh, uh, and, it, and that's really cool, you know, and so we brought him in and basically our, our premise is, how do we do what you're doing? How do we quit punching into a time claw and do something that we really love? And so the whole se the whole series is based on people telling us how they did that. Um, another five pounds of sugar. Um, Bob Pringle is over at our Cryptovania booth. He's got a bunch of books that he wrote. Uh, he's got five books that he wrote, and including one about Nebraska Bridge. And he ended up becoming an author basically because he lost a bet. And, and he had to put his money where his mouth is, and he ended up writing a, a, a book that ended up being all right and found that he could start being a writer. And so he did five books now, and we interviewed him. Bob, how did you get to be to the point you're making your living without punching into a time clock? We want to do that. Give us the hints. And so that's that's the, the, the five pounds of sugar. That's us trying to figure out how to do what we love. Because we'd love to do just this. If we could make money doing Bigfoot and Paranormal, we would making anything so we still have to do tires and that's again in finding a story and embracing it and that's that's again that's what we're about find your story find a passion and do it and talk about it and share it with your friends yes sir is there a lot of Sasquatch sightings down by Nebraska there's a few that we've had a um, matter of fact we did an episode called tie nesta chatter where a guy was mushroom hunting up there around nebraska and he got some kind of weird chatter out of him. and he felt like he was escorted out of the woods basically uh, by this this chattering he thinks that there was two of them chattering um and he didn't feel threatened but he did feel like he was being escorted out and he now goes back a lot. He's gotten bit by the Bigfoot bug. That experience now, he goes back and he goes there all the time. Um, Minister Crick, which is kind of just up above, we've heard lots and lots of talk about strange encounters. Some of them Bigfoot and then others maybe more UFO or kind of, kind of creepy. Um, but Minister Crick seems to have a lot of 
a lot of weird activity and a lot of um, weird tree structures that seem like they're manipulated. Not just happenstance from storms or whatever, but weirdly manipulated. Um, and the Nebraska Bridge, that's really, that's a, that's a huge passion for me too. Um, Matter of fact, I just had a, a, a friend here that I had met online that had contacted me uh, about the movie we were making about Nebraska Bridge. And he has a bottle that had a message in it that he found in 1964 while he was canoeing above Emlinton. He found this bottle. They were, they were just they were on a sandbar or something, and he saw it sticking up out. And he found the bottle. It had a cork in it and a message inside the bottle. And it and he opens it up and he finds that the, the message and the bottle was thrown in at Nebraska Creek in 1911 by a young 14-year-old Harry Combs. He says, I, I threw, and he says, I throw this bottle in the creek at Tyanesta, uh, April 14, 1911, signed um, uh, Harry Combs. And so we've, he, he contacted me and he said, I got this bottle and I've had it for decades. And he just showed it to I just got to see it for the first time actually a couple hours ago. And there it is, this this quart bottle from some kind, I think it's a grape soda from a, a, a Philadelphia bottler. And you can see like the rough sand in it and stuff and the cork is is just about gone. But he has the, the paper that he was a teenager when he found it, so he, he used masking tape to to protect it. And so he's got this this thing and he calls it one of his prized possessions of his life you know and here he is he's a little older than me and he's held on to this and it's one of his favorite things and, and, and you know I can't blame him I can't blame him and we'd like to use them for our movie because you've got it helps bring us along the timeline because you've got Harry Combs throwing this in the crick in 1911 you have our, my friend Bob finding it at, at or William sorry Bill finding it in 1964 and then coming across me in the 2000s you know it'll help me bring it across the timeline so out in Ohio you got them flat railroad tracks the trains going 80 mile an hour so they have these whistle markers and they look like a big tall skinny tombstone they're like maybe they're six feet high and they're maybe a foot and a half wide maybe eight inches thick they're made out of concrete some of the old time ones are, are made out of uh, sand stuff and they have a w carved in them and the w is painted black so when the uh, train is speeding along the tracks they see that marker and they know to hit the whistle because there's a dirt road crossing right in front of them so i said yeah he was about 50 yards on the other side of that whistle marker went down where the that creek crossed it the, the west branch of the black black, black river there went in a big pipe underneath the railroad rails. It came out to the side. He, he, he crossed over there by the creek. So it turned out that uh, that was about 50 yards behind that six foot tall whistle mark. When he was going down the side of the tracks there, he was at least two foot taller than a whistle mark. So years later, my son, the PhD, did some math and figured it out. He said, that, that thing was nine feet tall. And I says, I know it was big. And he was big, tall, and his shoulders were four foot wide. And um, so anyways, it stepped down and went in that creek bottom and it was heading north. So we went down there and looked where it went down into the creek bottom and he stepped in some soft sand. Now, at the time I was in high school, I was 16 years old, I'm six foot tall, weighed 200 pounds. Uh, I took off my tennis shoe, took my sock, and stepped down to next to this track that was in the soft sand and mud. It was just filling up with water, it's fresh. We could tell it just happened. So that track was a full inch deep. My track, barefoot track, and the sand next to it was only a quarter inch deep. So that was telling us he had to be at least seven to 900 pounds. I mean, whatever it was, weighed way more than that. So we went, went, went down to our truck. We got into our truck and we went down about a quarter mile because there was a farm right next to railroad tracks. By the time we got back to the truck, the next farm was my cousin's farm. So we drove the van halfway back into the field, halfway back into the field, and there's a creek there. And uh, so we set up the creek kind of branch there. So me and my buddy were sitting on one branch, and my uh, dad and uh, brother were sitting on the other side. And we sat there until dark, and we didn't see him the rest of the day. 
Now that was the first time I seen him. He was in the clear. The second time I seen him in the clear was about two weeks later. And um, at the time, my cousin's farm was there, uh, not too far from the railroad tracks. And my cousin calls me up. And she says, hey, Dave, what are you doing this weekend? I said, nothing, why? She says, well, mom, dad, and her sisters went to a wedding in Michigan. I'm here alone on the farm taking care of the animals. And that thing's coming here at night in our garden eating our sweet corn. I says, cool. And she goes, and Susie's going to be here. She was a New London High School cheerleader. So, of course, I'm going to be right there. So I took my trusty 3030 and I grabbed my dad's 357. That was my armament. Not that I wanted to hurt him, mind you, but we didn't know what, the, what we were dealing with. And so uh, it was a, like a Friday night, and we're sitting in the kitchen. And for you old people, you know what I'm talking about. You younger people won't know what the heck I'm talking about. But we were playing a board game called Parcheesi. And we're sitting in the kitchen, and uh, wind was coming from the south where the garden was, and suddenly the kitchen filled with that aroma of Sasquatch. He, he's out in the garden. So we run upstairs to my cousin's bedroom, and I have a six volt powered spotlight. And so he's in the garden, and it was there were stars out, there was no moon, and we could make out something standing in the corn, because he was taller than the corn. And he was down there eating. We could hear him eating the corn, you know, and it's like, Girls are getting freaked out. I says, okay, on the count of three, I'm gonna light him up. One, two, three. We hit him with the spotlight. He looked up at us real quick, big red eyes. He looked up at us real quick and took off running. And he was running for this swamp that was across the road from the farm. So that was, I saw him just for a quick second. It wasn't a very good sighting, big red eyes in the garden eating sweet corn. So then um, the next day, as soon as I got died, I was all excited, I couldn't go back to sleep. So as soon as I got daylight, I went out, passed around for tracks, found out where he was coming from. He was coming straight out of this swamp, coming up this ditch line, crossing the road, over into the yard to get in the garden to eat the corn. I called my father and I said, I saw it again last night. And uh, it's almost every night she says he's coming in eating the sweet corn, eating up all the sweet corn. My dad said, okay, I'll be there tonight. So he brought my brother, my uncle, and my dad showed me. So I picked out a real good place, that field there, going back to that swamp. It's 300 foot of a short of a mile long and about a half mile wide. Half of it was piling in the corn and the other half towards the swamp side was just, uh, because they got a planted late, it was just the hay field. So it was on the edge of the hay field. They started cutting, it started raining, so they stopped. So we're about 40 yards from this ditch line where this thing was walking. So we set up at night, we're waiting. We got out there just about dark, around nine o'clock. And we were waiting, and it was around midnight. We finally hear footsteps, we hear them coming. And uh, so, so anyways, you know, I was telling them how big this thing was, and uh, I had my 30-30. I told my dad, I said, you know, I'm, he said, you bring them out. I said, have them bring that old 3855 that they used in Pennsylvania for deer. So he brought out the old 3855. A little bit more firepower. There's this big 800 pound animal, and we're going to be sitting 30 or 40 yards away from it, and we're going to jump up in the middle of the night and go surprise with the spotlights. So I was kind of worried about that. Uh, not that he acted violent to anybody, but I was just worried because we were dealing with something that we didn't know what we were dealing with. And um, sure enough, here he comes. He gets up just the breast of us, he's about 40 yards out. And there was three of us that had spotlights. We let him up and he was in the clear. He was 40 yards away. And we got a good look at him. Just for a few seconds before we turned and ran back to the swamp. But I, what happened just before that, the reason he stopped, he heard me, I was kind of scared. So I kind of like jacked the shell into the chamber. He heard it, he stopped, he looked. And that's when we hit, my dad swore at me and we hit him with spotlights. So there was, Four of us had seen him that time, and a couple weeks before, there was three of us that saw him together. So that was the second time I seen a Bigfoot in the Since I've been on the show as of yesterday, I have 149 people to come up and tell me that they've seen Sasquatches in the Allegheny National Forest.
Now I do festivals and stuff and storytelling for the Boy Scouts, I go to local campgrounds and stuff, and that's what I do. I, I don't make any money on it, I'm just a storyteller, I have fun, and I get some stories in return. So I have 149 Sasquatch reported sightings, and probably about 95% of them are road crossing stories, and the rest are camper, hunters, and hikers. I have about 100 UFO stories, um, probably a thousand spirit light stories. In fact, I was a hot spot, a Bigfoot hot spot, about five miles uh, west of here. When I got out of here last night, I went there and sat there at 12.30 with the people who own the property by camp. We didn't see any Sasquatches or anything, but I did see a spirit light, which are common up here. A lot of people see them up here. I think little luminous orbs about this big, you know, like about the size of a soccer ball or smaller. Uh, blue, green color, sometimes they're blue color. Sometimes just pure white light. And it happens a lot of it. So we saw one of those last night. Well, it lasts. Well, it will last forever. I don't know what you what you yeah, could do. Thing, Kate. If you're not going to use a bunch of it. Yeah, they have like uh, really big jugs or jars of them. Huh? Uh, they have really uh, big jars yeah, of them. The rest of it, yeah, but what I'm thinking is, see, this is. You could you, you could keep it as a thing after you see what I'm Oh yeah, yeah. Like put stuff in it. Yeah. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Talk to you. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'd like to get the big thing if I can. This one. Yeah. Yeah, you will. I mean, because I tried it yesterday. It's really good. Yeah. You, yeah. You want this one? Or you want a jump? Um. Can I get the leaf one? Yeah. Okay. So. Bigfoot. That way you can see him coming. You might want to see him. The wait a second. There we go. That's better. The least expensive, energy-wise way that a spirit can make itself known to you visually is what we call orbs. Now, in my experience, I investigate these things, but 99% of all the pictures of orbs I've ever seen are not spirits. It's usually dust motes. It could be insects flying real, very rapidly through a, uh, a, flash, a flash camera. Also, um, pollen. And sometimes I, you can get the pollen blown up. And you can even, if you have somebody, a horticultural expert, they can even tell you what tree that pollen's from. And from that, the next one up, we would call they're shadow people. Everybody hears about shadow people, and everybody says, shadow people are bad. No, they're not. They're just another way of a spirit making himself known. These things can't hurt you. You're just looking at them. And they, they move pretty rapidly. Shadow people and stick stick figures. It takes more energy to manifest themselves that way. Then the next one up from that is a partial body apparition. You may see uh, someone from the, the knees up, or you know, just, just a head floating around like this. And that's a partial body apparition. That takes a lot of energy. Then the most amount of energy is used for a full body apparition. And that's when you actually see a, the image of a full person out there. And then the top one is full body, full color apparition. I only know of one. And I have a picture of it at my booth uh, that we, it was taken in the Ligonier Tavern in Ligonier, PA. There are other ones, but that's the only one I know of that actually got photographic evidence of. But we were able to research and find out who it was, and he had died like six years before the picture was taken, and this kind of stuff. Okay, they, they are a, a product of the underworld, and they never were human, whereas spirits are human. Okay? They're like bad angels. Right, right. And when, when we encounter something that we know it's not a spirit, and we think it might be a poltergeist or a demon, okay, we get the hell out of here real quick and we refer to people to someone who knows what they're doing about that because we don't we don't know what we're doing about that that's not our area of expertise and it's, and I'm honestly with that stuff can be scary but i'll tell you what in 20 years of doing investigations and doing over 400 investigations i've only encountered that twice it's not like on tv where everything bumps is a demon thank you very much for letting us be part of your festival here it looks like they've got some announcements and things to do. Stay right by. Here we go.